Do please welcome Mexico. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you for allowing us to open this, this uh, conference. This is going to be a general presentation of the contribution of the Teatro Ojo project, and it's titled A Few Lightnings. Um, first part is actually called In the Beginning Was Uncertainty. The lively disagreement the participants of the draft conference in Bombay in 2015 experienced when faced with their different approaches to the notion of public art may not be entirely stitched through a forceful agreement on terms and categories such as the public sphere, public space, publicity, or the republic as the public thing. This is not only because of the dislocation of North and South political discourses and practices of interaction, but maybe also because of the impossibility of locating a separate fixed category for a matter that is mostly of contingent destination. Once back in Mexico City, the Teatro Ojo group and the team working with them in the draft framework, Elena Chavez and me, found ourselves full of doubts and concerns on which could, the next, could be the next step in the project. We were very aware of the importance that in our social milieu, a number of public gestures and images had in a particularly difficult and stressed moment of local politics. Traversed by the perpetual cycle of political and criminal violence, in the all too visible deterioration of all kinds of public institutions, faced with the advance of the drug dealers' gangs and the encroachment of new forms of exploitation of global capitalism, and in the way the growing political dissatisfaction of wider circles of the population and the despair in the face of poverty and insecurity seem to render any form of political participation both useless and urgent. And I want to linger on that paradox, that we were facing a situation where everything seemed useless and everything seemed urgent. We were both aware of the importance that visual practices have had in the politics of mourning and protest in the recent times, and also on the way the non-matrix work of the Teatro Ojo group had involved an attempt to reroute the experience of theater as a means to enhance the examination of the attitudes of the audience towards political life and in terms of the history of the social movements. But we were clear that the questions raised by the draft symposium in Bombay demanded that we would need to experiment to rethink the possible role of a self-referential critique of artistic modalities of public art and intervention, and even in the hint of a possibility of serving to a theoretical self-questioning, and, the, and if possible, to an advance of so far unforeseen venues of activity and possibilities. While in the past, a specific set of circumstances, a certain anniversary, the proximity of a political moment, or the demand of the state of affairs of the country was a necessary part of Teatro Ojo's practice. We were now faced with a somehow abstract demand of producing a work that rather than, than answering to a circumstance would involve questions that at other time in history would have been called methodological. As you know, draft expected from each of its participants to produce a local symposium, conference, and or academic event to review the situation of issues of the public nature of art in the present. Facing with the task of contributing to a project that not by chance had been titled Draft, we decided to use such conference as a form of essay rehearsal. And I, these, these are words that are conflated in the notion uh, of uh, ensayo. In, in, in the Spanish language, essay and rehearsal. So rather than indulging in our hesitations and doubts uh, by addressing them in a paper or document, we decided to turn those concerns into a theatrical scholarly experience. 
Teatro Ojo decided to intervene, hijack, or subvert the concept of the conference to make it an invitation to perform as debate, to think and act in public, and to question the condition of the Mexican public and social predicament of the day under a clearly defined theatrical apparatus. So instead of calling a number of speakers to present a paper under a certain thematic guidance, we invited 14 heterogeneous participants, activists, journalists, historians, philosophers, and artists of different kinds to use the stage to respond to an invitation that consisted in a set of images that, in a review, summarized to a great extent the experience of the troubled times we were going through. This atlas of flashes that included press and social media images and short films became the point of departure for the guest interventions that we didn't intend to control or specify at all. The event titled And Many Images Came to Me was named after the words of Ma that Marisa Mendoza used to describe her reaction when she first saw the image of the faceless corpse of her husband, student activist Julio Cesar Mondragón, as he appeared on Facebook, the image of the corpse, on the fateful night of September 25th, 2014, the day the students of the Ayotzinapa School in Guerrero were kidnapped by the local police in Iguala. And I'm going to quote the statement of the widow where we drew the title of the event. She said, various photographs were uploaded on the internet, on Facebook, and I need to stress the importance that this is the book of faces. Among them, the one of Julio Cesar. Then, since I recognized his clothes, recognized part of his body and everything, I discovered that it was him. I felt very sad and that I would never see Julio Cesar again, and many images came on me, to me. Like if I had been there with him at the moment they did that to him, that they removed his face entirely while he was alive, torturing him in the cruelest manner because he didn't have any bullet holes, only many blows on his chest, his waist, his hands, end of quote. Pasar de la confusión al entendimiento de la complejidad de lo que estamos viviendo. Hay tres grandes tendencias en este momento de transición civilizatoria. La contradicción capital-naturaleza que está conduciendo hacia una catástrofe ecológica. Y en México, por ejemplo, solamente en cuatro estados del norte hay 26 mil concesiones mineras y podemos suponer lo que eso significa en términos ambientales para estos estados una situación de guerra permanente a la que hoy nos hemos referido de alguna manera y una creciente desigualdad. Yo vengo del estado de Michoacán, eh, busco desde el 2007 y exijo al estado mexicano que presente con vida a mi papá, que es defensor de los derechos humanos. En este camino no estoy sola, eh, yo vengo de un colectivo de familiares de personas desaparecidas, en el estado de Michoacán, donde ha tenido que ver directamente las autoridades en su desaparición. Mi llamado es que también ustedes puedan involucrarse en visibilizar desde el arte eh, lo que está pasando. ¿no? Esta mentira que la han trabajado desde hace mucho y que nosotros eh, a veces también tenemos un estigma con los familiares de los desaparecidos, que no sabemos sus historias, pero que si ustedes se pudieran acercar a cada familiar, vemos que hay un proyecto de destrucción en México de la juventud. Estamos todos en este sótano. Bajaste las escaleras y notaste que el piso de este lugar es negro. Cada agitación, un revolver de la tierra. Cada cráneo, un anillo nuevo del cascabel telúrico. Una resonancia colectiva tiene algo de viento. Puede llevarse a otros a su paso. El campo de guerra en el que vivimos parece tener como objetivo 
el exterminio de ciertas vidas de la forma más siniestra, desmaterializando la materia, anulando los cuerpos. Incluso cuando la memoria de esos cuerpos deviene imagen, en su misma condición de imágenes logran ser imágenes de una pérdida. Aunque no soy servidora pública, reitero, es importante para mí comunicarles que un objetivo fundamental para el gobierno de mi esposo celebra la ignorancia, la falta o el bajo nivel de educación, el machismo, la violencia, el clasismo y, por supuesto, el racismo. Tiene mucho que ver con, una, con dos, dos elementos fundamentales del México de hoy, la desigualdad y el racismo. La mayoría de las víctimas de la violencia, no todas, pero la mayoría, la inmensa mayoría, ya eran invisibles en vida. Ya eran invisibles porque eran pobres, ya eran invisibles porque eran morenos. Y este es un país en que los únicos que se ven, los únicos que están en las primeras planas de los periódicos, salvo que estén en condiciones de criminales o de cadáveres, son los blancos y los ricos. Y entonces, es, este es un país que en vida condena la invisibilidad a la inmensa mayoría de su población y de esa invisibilidad, de esa indiferencia que se ha manufacturado a lo largo de decenas de años de desigualdad y de racismo, de esa indiferencia y de esa invisibilidad surge la posibilidad de la muerte. Y dejará de correr una serie de imágenes para que vayan cayendo como tengan que caer en una versión eh, que intenta eh, mostrar una cierta historia secreta de la violencia, una, historia, una cierta historia secreta de la violencia y no tan secreta, que, que, que flota en, en un poco en el fantasma, en, en, en la conciencia fantasmática de todos nosotros. ¿no? ¿Cómo metes a los 43 normalistas en un bocho? ¿Eh? Pues todos en el cenicero, juntitos. No a los medios, no a la religión, no a la política, no al enriquecimiento ilícito, no a las diferencias raciales, no a la sangre, sí a la vida. ¿Qué, qué, 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 qué te pasa? Nosotros, pese a todo, pese a la mala fama que pesa sobre nosotros, hemos logrado que por lo menos se sepan historias, parcialmente si ustedes quieren. Las más importantes historias de corrupción en este país vienen de la pluma de un periodista. En la Cámara de Diputados se pelean, en el Senado se pelean, se pican los ojos, se dicen hasta de lo que se van a morir, pero cuando un amigo cumple, cumple años... Las diferencias quedan atrás. As I hope you will, you will appreciate, we were sharing with our other participants the burden of trying to explore the predicament of defining the value of culture and art in relation to the worst possible circumstances. We understood explicitly the locus of the image as key to the experience of the Republic at one of the darkest and most painful moments in modern history. As I had tried to argue in a paper titled A Landslide, Landslide of Images that was printed in the booklet that served as program of the event, we understood that images were part of the texture of the event, that in fact our political experience was traversed by the force of what was to be seen. And I will quote from that. We are not in the territory of art, but in the overflowing passions of the public sphere, in an exchange of faces always harried by the possibility that the observer decides to join us one more. Naturally, a mobilization is not made by a series of visual objects, but bodies and the signs that traverse those bodies. Yet even so, it appears to me to be difficult to argue against one of the characteristics of the mobilizations that traverse the grave social crisis of Mexico of this decade is the assertment of the clashes of the visual imagination and the dispute to control this space of intervention, the setting into motion of a political field inhabited by ghost effigies." End of quote. The event that took place between January 21st and 22nd, 2016, at the Muak Museum Theater with a significant audience, and furthermore was recorded by video, 
involve a rare and at times unbeatable mixture of academic thinking, civic mourning, political expression, and, in, and even a number of neodada acts and parodic sketches. At times, laughter was mixed with indignation and tears. We're not far away from the difficult task of thinking. It was cathartic and hesitant, intelligent and emotional, hopeless and challenging, if not offensive at times. A, how, a whole array of forms of cultural response in hope of sharing amongst us the certainty, certainty of darkness and the hope of a certain illumination. Two, thunderstorm. To a certain extent, during that January symposium, the Teatro Ojo group and its associates had restricted the role to that of spectators and producers of their own event. We had concocted a theater in pursuit of ideas, hoping to come out from the two days of the symposium ready to engage into a new work that we couldn't fathom on our own, delegating theory and inspiration to the magic of the stage. A certain faith in the creativity of others had induced us to transfer our questions on the nature of our role on the public sphere to our colleagues and friends. But instead of coming with fresh inspiration, we had been challenged. By the end of the symposium, as you may have witnessed in the film, psychoanalyst Manuel Hernandez felt the need to interpolate us artists, curators, critics, with a, with a rather worn out issue. How could we escape from the confines of the art world, the red circle, and the academia to address a real audience, a green circle? How could we infiltrate the actual public sphere and start changing the culture of the times, seemingly dominated by the epics of violence and the propaganda of fear? How could we go beyond our own space? It would be pointless to discuss if Manuel Hernandez's question was pertinent or if his argument was sound. As a good intervention, it was more interesting for its outcome than for its premises. It was more significant what it cost than by in its internal logic. It provoked an internal discussion between curator Helena Chavez, the members of the Teatro, Teatro Ojo group, and me. And at one point, became, that discussion became so heated that pro, pro, uh, practically provoked a schism. It was only when one of us got enraged and threatened to leave the project that in a flash of collaboration between artists and theorists, an answer to that was to, what was to be done emerged. We clearly saw that the strategy of provoking thought and questioning through the distribution of public images was powerful. And that rather than transmitting arguments or theories, we could produce a number of provocations that would be, be intellectually and effectively challenging by appropriating the model of the TV advertisement and the clip. Why not distribute political messages of a poetic political kind as advertisement interrupting both TV and YouTube programs. Short narratives, some of which had to be graphic and nonsensical in kind, like many of the performative moments in the symposium we had experienced, could be introduced as paid advertisement through YouTube, and hopefully, we also could convince a public TV station to do the same and occupy this kind of unforeseen content with the empty space between movies, series, and documentaries. Why not to have an ad that was not trying to sell anything, that was only trying to steer a response? The idea of the image as a lightning in the midst of the night gave identity to those materials, mimicking the new strategies of capitalism, 
which occupy the interspaces of entertainment to sell commodified ways of living and thinking, we understood the possibility of recovering the land between the waves of, of video in the internet or the, or the TV as means to share with the audience our, aware, uh, uh, our awareness of living in a political space of images. In other words, we toyed with the idea of using the hunger for content in new media as a form of political illumination. While the Teatro Ojo group started to devise the different short ads in a format that goes between 20 to 30 seconds, Elena Chavez and, 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 sorry, and worked to clear out or circumvent the copyright issues involved, and in fact, went back to invite several of the collaborators of the symposium to share the task of producing content, Helena Chavez and I went to negotiate with the University Public TV channel to find a broadcast space for the series. We were lucky to find a warm reception from the new director of the University channel, Nicolás Alvarado, who is aware of the way the old monopolistic notion of the TV channel is historically dead, and the need of rethinking public TV as a matter of a heterogeneous platform of production and dialogue, of an equally diverse manifold of actors producing content. So far, Teatro Ojo has created 43 clips. That's a symbolical goal that was achieved, in collaboration with filmmaker Rafael Ortega. The element in common of all those clips is their unpredictable nature. They project the shadow of a possible video consumer active enough to rethink his or her position to the present in terms of the belonging of a republic made of shared commotions and conflicts. Of course, these interruptions have a certain local content. They are aimed to occupy a shared experience that can only be political because it's located. These are signatures of light in the void, ghosts of intelligence in the midst of historical loss. I'm going to present some of these clips, and sometimes I'll add some, some means to decode some of the images. ¿Cómo ha sido su vida en los últimos años? ¿Cómo está su familia? ¿Actualmente tiene algún presentimiento? ¿Recuerda algún sueño que haya tenido en los últimos años? Porque ustedes tienen el derecho de conocer la verdad. Porque ustedes tienen el derecho de conocer la verdad. Porque ustedes tienen el derecho de conocer la verdad. Porque ustedes tienen el derecho de conocer la verdad. Porque ustedes tienen el derecho de conocer la verdad. That was the wife of the president, a soap opera star. And that, of course, is the Mexican territory. Estos procesos de crisis no son malos para todos. A algunos les está generando inmensa riqueza.
programa de esa prensa que se nutre del Tesoro Nacional puede resumirse en estas palabras. Guerra a la honra de los ciudadanos, alabanzas de las torpezas o delitos de los funcionarios. Y ese programa desastroso conjunto de venalidad y de cinismo agresivo flota como una bandera negra solapando crímenes, amenazando virtudes, propagando la maldad y la barbarie. Paso la siguiente, ¿no? Three, Beyond Geometry. The square and the sphere. Almost unheard as proper unconscious associations are, an implicit geometry defines our concepts of the public. As some of the debates of this project attest, we seem to, freq to be frequently entrapped by the archetypical definitivity of our traditional concepts of the public. Seduced by the mythology of the Agora in Athens, the Forum in Rome, or the Comune of Italian cities of the Renaissance, all of those European references, the public square appears to us as the site where the presence of bodies in the open gives some materiality to the assumption that our social systems are still political and civic in relation to the understanding of the city as the reference of, referent of all kinds of politics, somehow turning the square into the natural theater of historical action and discourse. Those against the bidimensional nature of such, such a speci speciality find themselves sedu seduced by the music of public spheres. The view that modern bourgeois societies were born from the institutionalization and technological implementation of public opinion and debate. The politics of the sphere had, certainly, a more immaterial condition than the old-fashioned idea of a physical ground of civic convergence. It suggested a continuously expanding volume of interactions and operations, a sort of visual planet growing along the physical extension of the flat Earth. A common characteristic of both sceneries was the presumption of light and air. Squares appear more emancipatory during the day, when they feel vibrant with the vigorous, vigorous sounds of the crowd and the dialectic of speeches, ovations, banners, and anthems, which turn rallies into popular festivities. Whereas the idea of a square in the night suggests either danger or repression, or the epics of revolutionary upheaval that occupy the public space as a defiance of the powers to be, and thus involving the threat of rioting and the need of entrenching or any other form of physical resistance. Instead, the public sphere appears in our imagination as a weightless, transparent, and clear bubble of air and light as Geronimo's Bosch's visionary erotical natural receptacles. The size of a public sphere is unfathomable. It can involve either the whole world or a drop of transparency floating in water with two joyous bodies inside. But then again, the sphere doesn't appear to exist in the night. The thin, almost non-existent membrane that separates it from the world magically disappears, leaving ourselves into the chaotic silence of the void. The whole point of the metaphor of the Enlightenment relies on the ambition of extending light until it covers the world. By means of an ever stop unstoppable generalization of reason, fact-based judgment, and cosmopolitanism, glass spheres do not have hidden dirty corners, neither strange passages or underground caverns. 
Their wholehearted ambition is the triumph of a geometry of transparency. When an electric storm pierces the darkness of the night, there is only a second of visibility. Way too short to allow the viewer an understanding of the landscape. Lightning is not the enlightenment. It flashes shine as an exception, more effective in terms of the after image it produces in our eyes than in creating an illuminated geography. Rarely do such shinings provide the root of scape or a full strategic view of the horizon. At most, the flittering crossing of images give rise to insist insistent ghosts. Rather than giving an open space of reflection and observation of data and debate, the crossing of light in the darkness feeds the awareness of poetry and dream of imprinted images. The analogy of, old -fashioned photographic, of the old-fashioned photographic plate is particularly apt. As both chemical and electric flashlight suggest, Photographic techniques grew haunted by the phantom of flashlight, breaking into the perfect darkness of the camera obscura. The single and incomplete shade left by a flash lighting and the after images of a storm have an element in common. The trace they leave in our thought and imagination is deeper and lasts longer than experience. They are sort of immaterial effigies and statues, monuments to the fleeting second of illumination, arresting the light and movement, preventing the flow of time and things and words. Very much like trauma, they are not only somehow permanent, they are constantly in danger of being invoked and called upon a new fleeting image akin in their uniqueness, in its uniqueness. In a great part of the earth today, subjected to the foul political landscape of post-colonial mimicking of democracy and the masquerade of the global world order, squares and spheres have been sized by different shades of darkness. We live times characterized by democrat dictators, elected demagogues, and consensus builders of social and neoliberal economic tyrannies. A combination of media control and all-pervading global skepticism, combined with an endless variety of forms of modern nihilism, conspired to turn the sphere of debate and criticism helpless. Reasoning and critique fall constantly prey of the seduction of advertisement and the propaganda of fear. As both the recent advances of right-wing populism in places like the USA or the UK and the conspiration on moods of real and staged coups in Turkey and Brazil would suggest the control of current societies relies more on hysterical effects and representations than in reasoning and fact. A politics of enlightenment risks sternly, merely into an elite cultural formation. Horrible as this appears to our sensibilities, the only political resistance that seems to take hold of the social imagination is a mixture of anxiety and identification. It's either based on a mild form of millenarism, as the climate change fears, or in case of despair, on the reprocessing of drama. At times it would seem to be that the more the representation of politics as corruption prevails, the more space there is for the idea that the only possible legitimacy is the personal proximity to tragedy. Old-fashioned charisma is replaced today by the exhibition of victimhood. In places like Mexico, where the role of public intellectuals used to guarantee a certain degree of honesty in the public realm, that role has been transferred to the relatives of those killed or disappeared. The only trustworthy energy to be found in the public sphere is bereavement and the call of unattainable justice. Under such conditions, 
there would appear to be no room in political life that often had to do with the need to address violence and corruption in this era. We are locked in a moment where requiem and parodies appear as the only possible poetic modalities available. In the midst of such territory, to recur to images to provoke moments of thought may imply a desperate attempt to challenge what counts as the sources of social excitement. It doesn't procure so much a logic of preaching and conversion so as to share with the casual viewer a moment of recognition where two isolated intelligences find themselves tied up by both the concern on the paucity of the historical moment and the hope of sharing a more intelligent mediascape. For, for such lighting not only reveals, reveals that we are not so isolated in darkness, but also that there is still pace between ourselves that is not entirely colonized by pathos and manipulation, but that maybe could be used by a different sort of sound and light. And that's the Mexican president and the Canadian prime minister. Hay dos grandes factores de movilización social, el miedo y la esperanza. Y las dos cosas nos están movilizando. Nos moviliza el miedo de que esto siga y se profundice y nos moviliza la esperanza de que pueda cambiar. Al pasar el tiempo, llegaron las lluvias y volvimos a ir a ese lugar porque presentíamos que había algo alrededor. Y como caen las lluvias y empieza a escurrir la tierra, empezaron a nacer los huesos que nosotros no habíamos visto.
pelea número uno del señor Salvador Rodríguez. Pasó, ¿Qué ocurrió? ¿Qué pasó? Hay, hay, hay balazos, hay balazos. ¿Qué está ocurriendo? Todos hay... están corriendo. Sí, señor. Sí, hacia señor. El entrenamiento, sí. Hay, 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 se escucharon se algunas detonaciones, sí, señor. Así es. Algo ocurre. Cuidado, calma, calma, Juan Carlos. Sí, señor. Resguárdate. Sí, señor. Ya estamos aquí eh, detrás de la cancha de, de Morelia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Am I being heard? Okay. So, um, no, no. I, I think I won't stand up. Thank you, Rohit. Um, my my question um, was with regards to these um, some of the 43 clips you have showed us. I wanted to ask um, if you've directly um, hit on the issue of racism. Because as the, the academic from um, um, Mexico, the anthropologist, all, and as you're all aware, as well as in the papers that were circulated, racism and classism um, created the conditions of possibility for their, disappear their disappearance, right? And, pri and prior to that, their, in their invisibility. So how um, are you dealing in these 43 um, clips with directly racism? I see um, elements of classism, but um, directly with racism, um, we can focus on human rights, and oftentimes the focus is on rights, but if they're not seen as human, in the first place, how is it that we um, can engage a Mexican public with um, a reconstitution of the human to include those that have been ex excluded, as um, Jital Jili gave the example of uh, people in Balochistan, the province in Pakistan, where uh, people are disappeared on the daily, right? So, it, and it's in, in the contemporary constellation of Pakistan, they are, uh, part of the populations that are seen as disposable. So I'm, I'm wondering how you have directly um, hit on the question of racism in relation to um, what is constituted as human. Thank you. Okay. Would anyone like to? Are you going to respond or do you want us to ask all the questions first? I think it would be easy just to say that there is one clip that actually takes on that statement by Federico Navarrete as one of the clips. Uh, we, we didn't show it because it would be repetitive to the, to, the, to the fact that you saw the documentary on the, on the symposium. There were some clips that were extracts of the symposium that we recycled. Well, they recycled some of those materials. Now, it's true that that has to be pushed more into the rest of the, of the material. Uh, uh, a good deal of what you saw and um, it is uh, important to just share with you the idea that all these clips have been produced in a matter of three months as a whole. Three, three months, four months. I mean, from nothing to, to uh, what is, is been, I mean, like, like TV is produced. I mean, TV is produced just uh, uh, on, your, on your knees. Um, uh, they depart from, from ideas that they had uh, Materials that have been in people's archive for long, and 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 uh, somehow there's a certain uh, uh, thing to say about the fact that that is a thought that is not visualized clearly in in the in the, in the materials that are appearing all the time. Uh, many, mo a lot of the images, as you probably saw, are image analysis or just the display of images that have a certain internal logic. But certainly, a part of that specific clip, there's no specific string of clips of getting on questions of racism yet. And also, I mean, the idea is not to create uh, fact, uh, arguments or something like uh, statements with the, it's not working, um, with the clips, but how we, how they use the images in order to create some kind of visibility. So I think all the videos or the clips are trying to create this kind of counter image and trying to produce another image that is not the one that is uh, in daily basis in the media. So I don't think it's uh, like an academic uh, 
a display about racism or whatever, but it's the way we treat our, the images also. So to make a, a different uh, kind of dialectical image of the, of the people. So it's not created in this kind of, I mean, I would, wouldn't say that it's non-human, but it's this kind of invisibility that creates this violence. So presenting that image in another way, we're trying to, to create another form of visibility. Thank you very much. I think we were, were you going to have another? Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guatamoc, for your presentation. I would like to somehow comment on the three points in a, in a rather loose way, starting with the last point, your geometry and your subtle discussion of this notion of the sphere. I would like to point attention that in your this last point, you made a shift between light and darkness, which can we interpret as a shift also not only in the spatial terms, but in temporal terms, from day to night and to, to uh, and I think I would like to come back to this in the, in the third point. The second point is, uh, is a question, uh, the presentation of your clips. Do you have any response on the clips? For me, for example, seeing the red image and the letters concerning the student whose face was taught alive, I, w I think that I will respond and the Swiss audience totally different to this image or to this fragment, to this clip, than the Mexican audience. Would you share with us a bit how were the responses to this? And this somehow leads to the, to the first part of the presentation where you introduced us and showed us we were more uh, producers and spectators than actors. And I find this highly significant because I found you producer of, of a very interesting line or border. You, we mentioned the term border very often. But here it seems to me, not only the border, what is public or non-public, which is for peers or for general audience, or the traditional border between the stage and the public, but is somehow a border between time and space. Uh, I was struck by the notion, uh, by your focus on the images, and there was this philosopher, woman philosopher, saying um, an image is never contemporary to its existence. Mm -hmm. And I found this striking in the, in the sense that uh, uh, what you present us from Mexico is um, our images of death, destruction, and extreme violence. And somehow every image um, takes uh, you in a realm of a history, of a history and a tragedy, and the way you presented this somehow is blurring, not blurring, but uh, giving us insights in the line between what is contemporary, what is Mexico today, so full of images which bear a tragical contemporary history. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, I guess that the first thing I need to say, thank you. There were several things you touched on because we're going to respond. Uh, first thing I need to tell you is that you're a focus group. The, the, the series will be starting to be broadcast the 8th of August. The reason this is happening is that we convened with the university TV channel to be part of their launch. Secondly, you're being subjected to a huge number of them. I mean, there were 12 as a whole. 15. Uh, 15, sorry, 15. And people are going to watch this as an interruption, one or two per day. There are a few that are serious where you could have variations during one day of the very same uh, ad with a slight change so that there would be a repetition, but you would find something different. But, it, but it's designed so that people will find this interruption. So my, uh, it's clear that the moment people are going to start receiving it, and I hope, I, I, I'm sure I was not clear enough on that, uh, it's going to be more or less like this. First, it will appear in this normal TV programming of something that I need to, to confess. I, 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 I haven't had my TV connected to the antenna since 1992, so I, I don't know what is it to react, maybe. Maybe that's a pro an issue that, of course, I hope that, that we are a different, different position there. But uh, secondly, we are going to be buying time in YouTube 
so as to have it as paid advertisement. That was our first thought on how to air it, and we are still to see what happens. It's an interesting media because if you happen to have people allowing it to run without interrupting it, then the algorithm decides to actually spread it beyond. It's, a, it's, it's again another interactive structure. So if people actually get on it, it will start to be running widely. Then it's going to be located in, in an internet site, and we'll start to distribute it by emails. We are going to have a whole number of ways of spreading it that involve a certain intervention and interfering, and we'll need to wait. Your, your, we, 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 uh, what you're, I mean, this, you're the first ones to actually see the material beyond ourselves and a little meeting that filmmaker Rafael Ortega made with a couple of friends to see their reaction, and it was... Yeah, actually, I mean, we wouldn't have... Uh, is it open? Yeah. We don't have feedback from the TV audience. We have the feedback from the people that somehow uh, part participate with us uh, producing the, the videos. We have the feedback from the relatives of the disappeared people uh, by chance, which was a very, I mean, it was very positive. Uh, but of course, we don't see them as the audience, but as um, producers as well with us. So. I believe that uh, the feeling of um, uncertainty that Cuauhtémo just talked about it um, continues until now. So once we have that, something to say, we, we, will, we will let you know for sure. Now, now that Christoph promised three more years of budget, <laughs> we have the chance to see you. To come back and, and tell you what's, going, tell you what's on. going on. Yeah. Thank you very much. And yes, please. Yeah. And then we'll open out. Yeah. Thank you. No, I'll project. Okay, there it is. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. This was incredibly rich, incredibly, um, incredibly full, incredibly emotional. I think it uh, evoked, at least within me, this idea. I, I, you were able to convey this question of. Um, Thank you. I'll try to project as well. Um, this, this idea that you began with, which was this, um, the sense of being useless and yet urgent and ending with that uselessness being the fear and then the urgency being the hope. You know, kind of, so I saw that, that link, which I thought was a very interesting one. And I was, and I was wondering, so I have three points, of course. So one of, my, one of the questions I have is that link between um, urgency and um, fear, between the idea of uselessness and some sort of idea of hope or vice versa, like playing with those, that configuration of those four words, specifically in relationship to the methodological concerns that you, you came up with and came up against. One of the things that I found so amazing about your, trans, your, your movement, your shift between what you presented in Mumbai and then what you're, you've done here is precisely um, questioning what is the political, right, and where that space is. And one of the one of the ways in which I'm, and so I'm linking this methodological concern to how you actually did this performance or this symposium, where you brought together in a transdisciplinary way the spectacle of the conference, right? And this idea of bringing together these different publics into one, right? And so one of my questions has to do with the ways in which you thought about that as a methodology of breaking down those disciplinary lines of acknowledging, in fact, that all of us make up these publics rather than making that separate, like how do we break into the public to recognize ourselves as part of a significant public that is a stakeholder in all of this and all of these publics that I see represented there. Um, and to also kind of link that as an intervention um, to, because what you've done here is you've, you've switched it from the technology of seeing, learning how to see, to learning how to listen and hear. Right? And so what I found also interesting in, in that methodological way was shifting your focus from seeing and visuality to listening to each other. Because what I think is so interesting about the like sort of political aesthetics and, and where art is moving is that it's not only anymore about our relationship to the state. Right? That we've theorized and it hasn't gotten us anywhere. Right? In this contemporary moment, it is actually more about what's happening between these groups, between the people. Where does trust work? How do they listen to one another? What's actually happening, not just in consensus building, but the ways in which social movements are mobilized? 
And to me, coming to the end of sound, hearing the rubber bullet, right? Knowing that that's a rubber bullet versus a real bullet. That sound is also something that is taught, right? That you learn. You don't know the sound of bullets unless you've heard them, right? So to think about linking together issues of visuality, of technologies of seeing, but also then technologies of hearing and sound, which it sounds like you're kind of moving towards, but I'm interested in how that links to your methodology. And then finally, this is the last point. Um, I have so much more, but these are the, la the three main ones that I really wanted to bring up. This question of image and memory. Um, I've, I, I'm an archeologist, and one of the things that I've often written about is that when I'm in certain spaces of um, heightened trauma, I don't take images, right? Because the images themselves replace my memories. In this case, I think it's a very interesting shift that you've done because one of the issues was to contest that anti-memory, right? So you've actually replaced the memory or the collective amnesia from the state to use the image. And so that I think is also very interesting in relationship to sound. So I know I've, I've put a lot out there, but you gave us a lot. And, and for that, um, thank you. I don't know how you're gonna answer that, but these are just things I put out there. <laughs> thank you, that's, that's, that's great. Are there immediate responses that you might have, any of you, to those major, major well, thoughts? I mean, only to, to start, because um, there's like a lot of things that I will have to think about it, but um, I think that um, somehow the way we found how to proceed, I mean, uh, through these questions had to do with um, start thinking ourselves, like the team that we were working, more as a bridge connecting um, these groups or these um, organizations that we start working with, with, um, with the media or like, you know, with the, with the artistic space as well. So more than um, assume as ourselves as creators, it's, it's more like assume ourselves as a bridge to connect those, those spaces. So that's talking about like the methodology about it. So, um, and I'll keep thinking about the, your questions and <laughs> I'll have more answers further, okay? I, I just need to say that there is uh, something that we, we are not addressing and is that this whole thing fall into place in an already existing configuration. There was a number of ways in which all of us and many people that were in the conference we belong to the mobilizations uh, 2010 and 2012 and 2014. <laughs> and some of the people there we have worked with and we have fought with. There's a sense of pressure on the museum I worked with and we collaborated in different things that happened in 2014 that made it useful and necessary to make a number of meetings and discussions and to actually mobilize that energy. And there had been silence for a year, what, 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 what uh, I think Christopher mentioned, that there was this, uh, this uh, receding uh, force. And Itanjali. Itanjali, it was Itanjali that, that mentioned that there was this, uh, this uh, after Christmas collapse of mobilization. So this conference also reactivated the field and the people who were there I wouldn't say happy, but they were, they were very committed to the idea of we are discussing again. Uh, uh, I don't know what to do about the silence and the, and the, and the, and the, and the image and the noise and the, and, the, and the listening. What I know is that the, 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 the question of how images traverse us, that was something that was part of our discussion, came in the paper that I prepared for the conference, and then became the thematic that organized the whole thing, has carried us all through this path. It's been something, the, the question of how do we administer live images, how do we deal with the trauma of images, is, it's been a force in the whole thing, rather than being uh, um, uh, something we want to move out. I mean, so it's, it's, been, it's been the, the underlying architecture of what we've tried to do. I mean, if you saw before in one of the clips, you see an atlas of images, a lot of Im images. And of course, there was this discussion with the people of the forum that, that it was too much and how to deal with these images. And if it was a political and, or a critical image to do that once again. Um, 
So I think also this idea in the clips, you can see like, uh, or you can hear the thunder, no? the noise. So we were playing all the time with, with this kind of uh, trembling images, you know, in this kind of uh, Chris Marker uh, idea of searching for the image or producing the image or using the technology to, to produce this image that tem trembles or that, that creates a different uh, form of image, you know, for example, the one of the pixel that, I mean, of course, for example, that was the most complicated image. We didn't want to use the image of the, of the corpse of, of Julio Mondragón, but it, it is too much to see that image. So it was kind of thinking in, in the image and how to create critical images and how to create a, a critical uh, relationship with the, with the audience. You know? Although it's an image that appears for yeah, as less flash. as a flash, as a flash. in the dark, in the in the dark uh, clip. I mean, in the last in the last clip, it was the last uh, it was one of the, the first. first. So it was a black, and suddenly it was just a flash. So it, because we don't know how to handle that image. I mean, for us, it's also all the time that we produce those clips, we were wondering how to use these images. No. Thank you very much. I just want to get a sense of where the questions are. At the moment, we've all comments, responses. There's a gentleman here and there. Let's take them one by one at the moment, but we might gather them depending on what happens. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks for your presentation. Actually, I was very intrigued, but and actually would like to ask if I correctly understand and maybe you comment. Uh, you said that the role of public intellectuals, their role in public sphere, transferred to the relatives of disappeared. Is it correct? Would be interesting to comment because I think it's not the same role. No, it looks like that the role also shifted somehow. Mm -hmm. So that would be really interesting. What kind of role these people play mm -hmm. because we are not so familiar with the Mexican situation. And then using my chance to speak, actually you also mentioned personal proximity to the tragedy how artists can yeah. reveal it. So I think it's really for me, that's two crucial issues in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank a you. very important issue for me that is probably easier to address by talking about the case of poet Javier Sicilia. So this is a moment where the role of the public intellectual, that among other things in Mexico, during the, the single party regime, was the voice of those that were voiceless. And you can criticize that, and logically it's to be discussed what was the role of the public intellectual, but one of the roles of, of, of the public intellectual was to point out the excesses of power, to stand for those that were actually being repressed. And so it's classical that there was this, te this, this uh, form where intellectuals would sign a manifesto on the paper every time there was something wrong. So their distance from the events, their privileges, the fact that they were allowed freedom and resources allowed them to speak for those. And I know that this goes against our understanding of representation. Now, what happens when rather than having that voice, you have the poet, the intellectual, as the father of the son that was killed? And all of the sudden, and I'm saying this with a certain, I hope, uh, uh, certain uh, trepidation, and, and trying not to, to turn it into critic, just as an observation. What happens when it is the fact that you have undergone the worst possible personal tragedy that invests you with public authority? Your authority is, he's a good poet, he's an important poet, and I respect him deeply. And he had a, he, he had a role in the, in the papers. But his singular messianic authority appears from the fact that his son was killed. Now, 
This is something that I would argue also can be discussed in, the, in, the, in, in relation to the Ayotzinapa case. And with all due respect, and knowing that I'm far away from home, I'm going to say something that I wouldn't be that comfortable to say at home. And is that the Ayotzinapa uh, students belong to a, to a certain revolutionary faction. And they were very Leninist. And somehow, one of the first uh, demonstrations uh, after the disappearance involved a moment of violence where the former presidential candidate of the left and historian and Marxist Trotskyite theorist Adolfo Gili were attacked with water bottles and objects by the people close to the Ayotzinapa school, and they were injured. Of course, this had to do with the, with the, with the hatred of Leninists against progressive social democrats, the claims that they had sold out. I don't know. I mean, it was the PRD who yeah. was the mayor of the town. No, but it was Cardenas. Anyway, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> clearly there are troubles in that. But nonetheless, it, from that moment onwards, the voice of the ability to concentrate the critique against the state, the authority on the left, was transferred to the parents of the, of the children that had disappeared. Then again, I'm not even attempting to criticize that power. I'm just underlying that shift. a shift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, uh, to, to, to suggest that there's this case where moral authority has changed hands and your proximity to the tragedy invests you. Maybe that's going to be a best form of representation. It's not my politics. I've always felt a, a little bit distant from that. Because maybe, maybe because it's not in my favor. But, because he wants to be in but at the same time, I, 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 I feel close to say that the martyr power is an incredibly important thing to start analyzing, mm -hmm. especially in places like mine where it's not fully formalized. Yeah? There are places like Lebanon where I've seen how it can be formalized, and I'm not going to be stupid to, to, to identify it. But then again, Look at what's happening in Europe. Then there is the, the, the political authority is just illegitimate. It has no, no claim of, of uh, legitimacy. There is an attack. There are victims. They have the voice. I'm, I'm just trying to point out to a very simple social phenomena that maybe I'm not able to to describe better, and that's what I'm trying to, 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 to address, that there is a, a transference of moral authority. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that, it's true. Uh, and um, It's not that I was comfortable with the former structure, but this is a, it's a very complicated <laughs> one. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope that was a useful response at the moment. Thank you. Gentleman at the back, yeah, great. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Giorgio from the Hong Kong group. Thank you, Elena, Demok, and Teatro Ho. Um, just make a couple, couple of glosses, some questions. Um, it's true that the image is no longer contemporary, but representation is a way of addressing reality, nevertheless, so some, some form of. So I'm wondering um, these, are, these short films, which I take as, you know, as a focal point now, for the sake of convenience, are representations of sorts. So I'm wondering how you're thinking about representation. And I'm also interested in the historical lineage of funerary art. Uh, I'm wondering if you have anything, you, you mentioned the Requiem. To some extent, these are funerary works, aren't they? Because there's a long tradition, particularly a sacred tradition of you know, celebrating or calling up images of the dead. Or, so I'm wondering about that uh, lineage or potential lineage as well. And finally, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, your ex exploiting a kind of aesthetics of interruption or 
right? Because the, the ad interrupts something or, and it's, it's a kind of a, a cooler show effect writ large because you don't know what comes before. There's a kind of montage here which you cannot control. Uh, and I'm very interested in, in, in finding out what will happen uh, when the short ads will appear. Uh, and I should also note that uh, in Italy, where I'm from, for instance, there, is a, there was a tradition of called uh, Publicita Progresso, uh, progressive uh, ad, or progressive advertising, you might translate it. Uh, um, in the 70s, when I, when I was a child, uh, the, the public television would you know, uh, fund, would ask artists and photographers to, to shoot very short ads uh, on topics sometimes very provocative topics like terrorism or social inequality or homelessness and so forth. So I'm wondering whether Italy was alone in, in this effort and I'm wondering whether you're aware of these precedents. Uh, th those were striking black and white, somewhat too slick perhaps for their purpose, but very striking ads and I still remember them when I was a child. So I look forward to discussing this more with you. Thank you very much. Anyone would like to? Sorry? Uh, I was not aware of that. One thing that I, 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 I think we've mentioned is that we know that somebody, a group in Berlin at one point, was making short films to be interspersed with the short adverts before the film, with the shortcuts. But I couldn't trace that reference. Um, surely there's going to be an interruption of a certain programming we have no clue uh, of, of what's um, uh, going to happen there. And that's exactly the point, that somehow, I guess that that is also a way to addressing this. These images interrupt a situation of normalcy. And at the same time, normalcy, the normal program just goes on. Yeah? The TV is still there. The Olympics are going to be broadcast. They are going to be the next election, and people are drinking beer and, and, and tequila. So there's this issue that all these trepidations are just crossing. And uh, I guess that that has to do with the, of, with the question of making a, a, a... I was trying to express it in the sense of Going through the night is something that I really believe is, is going to be a, a, a challenge. I, I, I think that going back to the question of hope, there was a discussion that we've had several times, and it's somehow like this. I mean, we refuse to advance the future. That's not our business. But for the moment, we are bracing to actually go through a long, long night. And we are trying to think a little bit, not too much in how to necessarily change it. We will try if we can. But what happens if we are going to actually be going through the night for some time? And what do you do through the night? Mm -hmm. I think that this is something that we've actually discussed several times. What does it mean to actually... Uh, uh, and is this kind of like Phase that, that uh -huh. question also of urgency and, and, and of course fear? We have a lot of fear, of course. I mean, the people you saw that we're working with, uh, they are working with, is uh, communities or organizations of people that have disappeared, or families have disappeared. So, uh, of course, there's a lot of fear, and also there's a lot of distance or the question of what we should do as an artist or creators or academics that it's really strange because we live in this kind of sphere of images, public images that are being uh, thrown in the, in the sphere, public sphere, but at the same time we're not part of that violence. I mean, in a sense, what Federico Navarrete said, the historian about race, it's right, I mean, we are part of that violence, but we can step out of that violence. But other people cannot step out of that violence. I mean, we can play this kind of being involved, being engaged of the discussion, being engaged with the communities, but at the same time we go to the middle class sphere and we can survive and we can deal with our, with our own reality, in a sense. So how we engage 
with that uh, and we are not collapsed by fear and we are not collapsed by, uh, I don't know, different emotions. So it's, it's really tense and it's really tense. I mean, in the middle of this, I got pregnant. So we are dealing with people that their kids have disappeared. So it's not easy to, to relate with all these things, but it's this urgency also to keep going and keep thinking. I mean, if our uh, profession is to think, we need to deal with this and we need to think about it. I mean, we are not going to solve it. We are clear in this, but at least we need to address it in a way, no? Thank you very much. Yeah, just, any, just get a sense of, uh, before we break for lunch, um, any other thoughts at this point? One over there, yeah, great, thank you. Very much, uh, I'm Roy from Zurich, and I was very fascinated and struck by this very um, mm, clear um, methodology of trying to uh, act the public debate, like to unlearn, like the being a, an, an unpolitical subject in the transparent public, but and to learn to be a, another political subject in a performative public that you create in the in the theater, but also with the video clips. And it's very, it makes totally sense to me to say, okay, we start in the performative space to enact a new kind of public and then go further into the media. And uh, I think it was, and I have two questions there, like uh, when, when, and I'm also interested to hear and as all of you, like how uh, this will, uh, how the audience will respond and the public will respond and the new public is perhaps created. And one question is, um, the, the, the movies, they, they are very playful and critical in using violence and making and de-block some kind of affective level of, uh, of fear and, and anger and, and probably suffering and, and sorrow, and uh, which might be really a, an important resource for a social movement. But I was wondering, what do you think? Is it relevant to have like a, a normative point, like a u utopian image as well, to, uh, to go further in this movement? Do you need something like a, an image of, uh, you sometimes you said enlightenment, justice, do you need this kind of reference? Or is it necessary to go deeper into this kind of immediate, affective uh, 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 uncertainty and fear and violence? in order to uh, mobilize something. You know what I mean? So do we need some kind of uh, utopian narrative, some normative uh, reference point to uh, unleash this kind of uh, social movement? And the other thing is like this one question, do we need this kind of uh, hope? Like there was one video clip that says, what, what keeps us going, fear and hope? Okay, where does hope come from? Do we need an image of hope, a narrative of hope, or is it already here, you know? Uh, incorporated. That's one question. And the other question is, or like this is more like <laughs> an idea is like, I mean, so many things can happen with these video clips when, when, when they go viral. And then I was wondering, wouldn't be it interesting also to perhaps even more try to manipulate at some moment this process and loop this back into performative um, sphere, you know, back to the theater or like ask people to produce these kinds of videos. This can happen anyway, because for me this was, this was like kind of a genre, like these violence ads. <laughs> it's already a genre, and everybody can do it. And I was, uh, uh, I, I remember this, uh, this Bollywood movie called PK, which is uh, a little bit silly, but also interesting somehow, because it's a remake of an E.T. movie, so Amir Khan coming as an extraterrestrial and he, he wants to go back to, the, to his people and doesn't know how, and then he goes to all the different religions because he thought, thinks they look up, and so they have this kind of connection, and then he feels uh, betrayed because then no, nobody helps him, and uh, then he, he's, he's like, uh, he works with a journalist, and says, and, and she makes a story about him because she thinks he's a very uh, strange person. And then he, he tells his story that all the religions, they have the wrong number, connection to God. And so, so suddenly you have this whole movement, social movement all around India in the movie where people send this video. When, and he says, if you think that your religious leader has the wrong number, send the video. 
by uh, make a video by, with your iPhone and uh, and send it to us. So suddenly this <laughs> this process of uh, of making something public and interactive becomes even more uh, uh, dynamic and uh, has its own uh, power. So I was wondering whether you have any ideas of like pushing this process further. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I will say something about, um, I don't know, being, uh, you know, blocked by uh, these images of violence, I don't know if it has to do with, like, working with the violence or trying to find this utopian image. What um, thing we have to go back to is, uh, perhaps, I know it might be a, an uncomfortable word, but I think we're in a moment where what we need to do, and that was the demands of these people participating in the forum as well, has to do with visibility of some things that they, don't, they have not um, found space enough to be known in, in the Mexican context. So perhaps it um, doesn't have to do with this, with a, perhaps with a utopian uh, sense of something, but um, begin with uh, making visible those things that, that are happening and are they're still happening today, so um, perhaps like the first step we have to, to take with the work with, the, with the, these people. I mean, the, the case of the representation of the 43 students is really interesting because as you might know, there's thousands of people that have been killed and disappeared in the last six years, eight years, thousands. And they are completely invisible, and there were no res social response. I mean, there was a first social response with the with the Cecilia, the poet kid that was uh, killed in in Cuernavaca, and it was a social movement around that. But it was really interesting to see that you don't control the images. It was the image of the 43 students that hit everything, and it just like create this uh, this kind of dialectical image in a way also because. Those were students, and the, the representation of the students invoke a very uh, clear trauma in Mexico because of the killing of the 68. So, of course, they were politicized because it, this is uh, a school that is part of um, a very complex story of, of guerrilla in Mexico because they are part of the, or link with a revolutionary guerrilla in, the, in Guerrero. But they are students, so when, People knew social, uh, I mean, like, uh, yeah, civil uh, society knew that it was students. It created another form of reaction or affection, if you want to say. But it was really interesting that the images that you saw or you might have seen in some place of the students is the images of the, the official ID uh, photographs of the schools. I mean, we all delivered those kind of, of images of us when we enter to the school. But what is really interesting is that that image is, of course, of an image of fear, no? if you see the 43 uh, images. But then those images were transformed in the social movement or by artists like uh, Lozano Heimer that create another form of image. That, that same image in other context, in the street, in the museum, using uh, very uh, different uh, forms of, of the device of that image, create also hope. So it was really tense because that image is an image of fear, of, of loose, of a lot of things, but also it's an image of hope when you see like people carrying that image in the streets or you see that image in a museum trying to address another kind of, of, of reaction of the people. So it's really ambivalent and, and that is the power of the image maybe that creates these kind of tensions. No? Hmm. I have a feeling that there's a I don't know if you would agree with this, but um, that there's a sense in which this project relates to a certain need to ascertain that there is a shared intelligence. That the question of instrumentality, of what are we going to achieve, is not clear. The question of how we are going to turn this around is unreachable. But I see many things that go through social media or texts that are only trying to be able to allow you to see clearer or to notice something 
or to be able to actually live in a space where this whole crisis is not simply a triumph of stupidity and, and manipulation. I mean, you, this woman, the, the wife of the president, is a soap opera star. The president is the fabrication of the TV networks. The powers to be are powers that are built through images. That's a, that's a premise. We, we, we experience in ways that are very common to all of you, but that are particularly uh, vulgar, uh, the idiocy of the way power is organized. And that's something that at least I guess that you can feel from the images. You're in a place where there are explosions, where, where a, 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 a national oil company or a gas station is, is a dangerous object. That the, the, the standards of living are, are, are grotesque. Yeah? And there's a certain sense in which I guess that the, the series, as things that sometimes come through Twitter or certain cartoons or a couple of texts are, are, are just trying to say, listen, we are not as idiot as all this thing is. And certainly there can be some, some latitude, yeah? And there could be a, some, some, a certain quality of, of, of being human being in the midst of this. There's this, I guess that there's also something that I need to say and again, I don't know if you would uh, 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 agree with me. And is the enormous, it's not happiness, but the enormous pride that you get from some of the things that were spelled out in the conference. When Dolores Gonzalez actually is able to bring out the map of what's happening and make a clear point. Where, where when somebody that is a useless, a professional useless person, a, a philosopher, is actually, is actually saying something that is important, I'm, I'm, that, I'm, helps. that helps, that, that, helps. that, that actually helps, helps. Mm -hmm. that, that you say, there's a point there, uh, where artist Carlos Amorales makes a performance where they are reading sections of Dracula. In, in a strange ceremony. Uh -huh. And, and it's a lot, a lot of witchcraft and, and text and, 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 and nonsensical understanding of what is happening. And, and there's a certain feeling that this is not a total waste. And, and maybe I'm just saying that if you're going to distribute the question of where's hope and where is fear, somehow hope is located in those interruptions. That, uh, that there can be a certain uh, conviviality of trying to be ready for the historical moment in a certain way. That is different from pretending to be effective. Right? And, and I really would like to just be able to, I mean, bang the, the desk and but, uh, have and it change, but it's not happening that way. And even that, I mean, it was not easy to have hope in the sense that he's saying that have like a collective uh, intelligence because we were like really naive producing the forum in a way because we were thinking like, okay, let's bring together different people from different perspectives and professions and let's think together and in public and have this moment of, of common or something. And it was kind of messy, and it was kind of uh, a lot of tension arise, and there was a lot of tension in between, for example, a uh, journalist and the artist, because the journalists were really, really mad. Like, we need visibility, and we need that you are part of our team of creating these kind of uh, narratives. And the artists were, like Carlos Morales, doing like a performance with Dracula and making noises and sound, and people, activists were like, no, we're not getting it. I mean, we need that you are part of the social movement. We don't need like this kind of interventions or, for example, the, the most um, yeah, intense moment was the moment of the cabaret. You saw that uh, a woman that was playing like a clown or something, and she was making jokes about 
the 43 students. And that was really, really uncomfortable. I mean, we were... And it was meant to be terribly uncomfortable. Yeah, it was, it was just was like... See, he, she was testing our endurance to the yeah. stupidity. And it was a really like tense moment that we were not in the same place. So it was uh, an interesting also point to say like, okay, we're not working in the same perspective. Not even us, that we are from the same, same like uh, scene, art scene or contemporary middle uh, academic scene, we were in the same uh, trend. So it was really interesting to see like, okay, how we can work together. Not even that hope is easy. So, <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Uh, we're going to go to Ashok and then we're going to go, yep, yeah, so one and, yeah, and then we'll stop for lunch. Thank you. Okay, uh, very shortly. Thanks so much. I'm just wondering about this word interruption and I want, if you could clarify a little bit. Uh, I like, I mean, I think it's a very interesting idea, but we have to think about a little bit what this means in the different contexts that you're trying to interrupt. Uh, and I just wanted you to say a little bit about what may happen on the 8th of uh, August when this starts. Because on YouTube, as far as I know, because I, I've never paid for an ad on YouTube, you can't actually l determine where that ad goes. And therefore, you can't link to it. And therefore, you break the aspirations of most of internet video, which is to become viral or be linkable. Right? So you, you have a video that is floating somewhere in the YouTube environment, but you can't actually refer to it yourself. You can't send your friends, hey, see this thing. Or maybe you can, and, but then you are linking to the Olympic video or whatever it is that is the host for your advertisement. So I think these different environments change what interruption means. And I'm just wondering if you're thinking about this in a specific mm -hmm. way. Oh. Yeah. yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, because I'm also, my, I ask myself if uh, we really sh should speak so much about image and imagination and not what Chidanjali um, raised, orientation. Because uh, when you say we walk in the night, yes, we walk uh, through nightly times, but we walk through in, in, in nightly times through algorithmic controlled media environments too. Yeah, so it's not only the, me the metaphor of the night. So, and so we have, and your work, where is it happening? Is it happening still in classical media where there is a sender and the receiver of an image and the public which you, or is it an algorithmic controlled network where it is more important where your video is placed to which other videos, yeah? So this is the, so the, and this, uh, the linkage, yeah? Of this, uh, and who links your videos to other videos? Uh, this you cannot control anymore, yeah? And, uh, but you can also describe then this uh, media place of these images also as an atmospheric information channel, yeah? Which is not so <laughs> enlightened anymore. It, and you need other bodies there, other senses, as you said, yeah? When you speak about orientation, um, and um, when you walk through the night, you need different senses, different bodies, and also in these algorithmic environments, you, you are a data subject, you are divided, you are individuum, not an individuum anymore. And um, so I asked me if you're also interested in orientations, to provide other orientations in these environments we are living in, in, in this nightly, uh, where these other orientations could happen. Is it in the media channels itself? Or is it what Rohit asked? We have to augment it and find hybrid forums, yeah? Uh, and or, or do, do you really believe you can inscribe other orientation systems in these algorithmic channels? Thank you both very much. Uh, it's very uncertain because what we planned was what does it mean to go beyond the red circle, Manuel Hernandez said. So, we are not Beyoncé. So the idea of using the YouTube ads was something in the line of this strategy of advertisement is breaking down all media. Is internet advertisement that is about to make the big Televisa corporation that has controlled Mexican media collapse. In the last two years, Televisa's shares have 
plummeted. Yesterday, the Guardian reported 67 million pounds of deficit this year, which is twice last year. So this algorithmic chaos that is controlled by the algorithm, this personally directed material, this fake randomness, is effective in changing the media landscape. So that's, don't ask me to orient myself there. I'm just pointing out, we thought, it's interesting. This force that is eroding the structure of the public sphere as it has been controlled is available to us. What's the price? Yeah, depends how much you pay, but it's something that we can, we are, we are going to afford it with the money of, <laughs> of, of, of draft. <laughs> now, with the Swiss money. So that was one platform. Second platform is something that we've seen artists using, which is just to spread through emails, trying to make chains, having it in, in, in a big deal in our milieu. It's a couple of people that send emails every weekend with a piece of text or thing, and I normally raise it, but I know they are trying to address me, so we're going to do that. Again, how far we reach, we cannot know. Thirdly, we went to talk with the TV station, the university TV station. There was a skepticism, yeah? It happened to be that they are in troubles, that they don't have money to produce content that the new director actually th thinks that it's a totally stupid thing to have made a TV station. That We're recording that, and it's going to be on YouTube, so... <laughs> it shouldn't be, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. And he's a very intelligent guy because of notice <laughs> in it. So he actually says, this is interesting. It's interesting that you're trying to produce content. It's a very, very um, difficult content. It's politically problematic, I'm interested in this. We need to sort out the problems. The copyright issues are very complicated. So we've spent a lot of time, and they've spent a lot of time, and Rafael Ortega, the filmmaker, on finding out how to get around copyright issues, locating people, doing tricks, whatever. So somehow I'm just telling you, we don't know at all the questions you're asking are, are, are valid. Maybe you thought longer about them than we have. And we'd love to be helped in thinking about them. Uh, we just had to make this go through quickly after a number of questions and jumping to the next stage. And yes, I can see that this is what's going to happen. I just know that we'll need to deal with that. I mean, that the. The, the, the situation is that we are at this precise moment, in a moment when we have a change of mode of production, I'm going to say it very classically, we are undergoing a change of mode of production, and we are not going to get anywhere through the nostalgia of the old ways of struggle. And it's a very dogmatic statement. I, 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 I'm, I'm just letting you know <laughs> what my experience is that everything I've been working politically in the last, in my, in my adult life, because I've been part of things, and I felt myself integrated in certain things, have vanished. And I abide to a phrase of late Carlos Monsivais that I adore, and I've seen people painting in huge walls through Mexico in several places. And the phrase translates like this. I don't know any longer if I don't know what's happening, or if everything I knew has already happened. Mm -hmm. That's the sense of uncertainty and that, where, where, we, where we are. Sure, it's not working. We, uh, well, I was trying to suggest, there's an image that I keep on thinking, and it's in an image that is slightly old-fashioned in Spanish, and it's the idea of the fifth wheel. 
friends, ladies, gentlemen, we are part of the fifth wheel. We are, re they are running, but we are not sustaining this. <laughs> that fifth wheel can easily be just thrown behind. It's not useless. It's not useful. But it's running. So I'm probably just saying something that, like, we don't know. The, the idea of interrupting is clear. There's a certain expressive mode of trying to think through the situation in trying to make these thoughts that we are learning from other people going through a different channel. We are tr hoping that the example of what we're trying to do will incite others to do other things. And locally or unlocally, we'll need to be part of the next scandal and catastrophe. I mean, the, the way we are living in that place means that sooner or later, in a couple of months or in a year, there is going to be another round. Mm -hmm. And we have to be in the streets, and something's going to happen, and we're just getting ready for the next one. And, and draft has been useful to think through that. But thank you. It's a whole lot of questions to, to address. Think about it. If Thank you can help you. us to manipulate the algorithm, we'll be very happy. Yeah.